I get it, the struggles are real. Right now everyone wants to upgrade their computer, but everything's you know pretty expensive with inflation and just availabilities and, but that's okay. Today I'm gonna give you guys five tips on how you can make your PC faster, regardless of how old or how new it is, and it won't even cost you a dime. The new T30 high quality PC fan from Fantex features a three phase motor, dual Vapo maglev bearing, 30 millimeter thickness for improved airflow and static pressure and a six year warranty, making the T30 fan a single solution for all your cooling needs. To see the full list of features, click the sponsored link in the description below. Okay, so these are not in a specific order, although there's a couple items that you would wanna do before others. So number one on this list right here, it's gonna sound scary to some folks, but trust me, depending on when you built your system, how old it is. So we're talking about updating your motherboard BIOS. Now, depending on when you got your motherboard, if you bought your motherboard at the very start of whatever generation that it exists in, there's probably been quite a few updates since then. Now, the reason why updating your motherboard BIOS could be important for your computer speed is a couple of reasons. One, microcode uh, on your CPU. Now, the microcode gets updated to your CPU through your motherboard BIOS. So depending on when you got your CPU and when you got your motherboard, let's say there's a big gap between when they were manufactured, if you have an early revision BIOS or even a launch BIOS, there's gonna be probably quite a few differences in your motherboard microcode for your CPU, depending on when your CPU came out. So if you've got a later revision CPU that could have a little bit better motherboard or uh, memory stability, memory compatibility, or just general fixes that a lot of people don't even know take place amongst CPU generations you know, as they age, updating your, your motherboard BIOS will give you some stability increases and potentially even better boosting clocks, boosting algorithms can all take place at a motherboard BIOS level. Now, a lot of people are afraid of updating their, their motherboard BIOS because they go, oh, if something goes wrong, then I'm gonna brick my motherboard. And that is an inherent risk that you potentially take anytime you install your motherboard BIOS or update it. Now, depending on when you got your motherboard or which generation it belongs to, it very well may have a, a BIOS flashback feature built in, which is absolutely risk-free because of the fact that if something goes wrong, you don't even need your CPU to be installed in your motherboard for it to work. So you'd be able to take a USB drive, plug it into the back of the USB flashback port. It'll be labeled with a white box around it normally. Start the, the BIOS flashback feature and you can update it uh, if anything goes wrong. Now, the reason why I would recommend updating your motherboard BIOS is not just because of the microcode and general stability fixes that you'll generally find in the motherboard uh, BIOS update. It's because of XMP and memory compatibility. Now, depending on when you got your CPU and your motherboard combo and your RAM, if you've not enabled XMP or the extreme memory profile for Intel CPUs or DOCP for an older AM4 CPUs for AMD, or AMD Expo for AM5, see it starts to get a little bit convoluted as you talk about it in the future, your RAM is not running at its full potential. The memory speed that is listed on your stick of RAM, which is the selling point for most people, not just timings, but most people don't understand timings to begin with, but they'll just look at the frequency and say, okay, I've got myself, I've got 3,800 megahertz RAM, DDR4. If you were not to go in and enable XMP or DOCP, depending on Intel or AMD, you're more than likely only getting either 2133 megahertz or 2400 megahertz. Now, depending on your use case and what programs you're using and how much RAM speed is important to those programs or those games, we do know RAM speed can give a very noticeable increase in gaming FPS, depending on your, your graphics card. If you are not running XMP or you have the fast RAM settings enabled, you're not getting the benefit of the item of which you paid for. And we all know that RAM cost is directly related to RAM speed and not just capacity. So if you've got 32 gigabytes of 3,800 or even 4,000 megahertz RAM, and you've not gone into your BIOS and enabled any of that, you're more than likely running at 2133, which means you are running at almost half the speed that you paid for. So it's another reason why I recommend updating the BIOS on your motherboard first because it will give you the best likelihood of having compatible XMP profiles and speeds that work with your CPU. You see XMP or Extreme Memory Profile slash DOCP or AMD Expo is an overclock. It is an overclock of the base frequency that the DDR4 or DDR5 is designed to run at. This also applies for DDR3, by the way, if you're running an even older system. I just, I believe DDR3 was 1,333 megahertz, I believe was the base clock, and DDR2 was 800 megahertz. Anyway, moving forward, it's not guaranteed to run. It is an overclock. So to have the best chances of your XMP profile of actually working and running, 
is by updating your motherboard BIOS. Now, before you do either of those two, I highly recommend you go into your BIOS by mashing the delete key when you're booting your system, going to your profiles and saving whatever your current config is. If you've gone in there and set your boot device and you've got uh, your fan profile set up in your fan tuning software, and let's say you've got a water block on there, so you had to tell it to ignore the CPU RPM, that way you don't get a CPU fan error warning every time you boot your system, then what you do is just save a profile, and if your system ever has to be rebooted or cleared CMOS, you can load that profile and be exactly up and running exactly as you were in case your XMP doesn't work or your fan settings get changed or whatever, and you don't have to spend all that time going through and manually adjusting it. So save your BIOS profile, update your motherboard BIOS, number one, enable XMP, DOCP, or AMD Expo, depending on the version that you're running, would be number two. Now, number three is once we're in the operating system, Download MSI Afterburner or whatever piece of software it is that comes with your particular GPU depending on what you're most comfortable with. And I'm not talking about overclocking here. I've talked about a million times in the past over the last almost 11 years now I've been doing this that moving some sliders and getting more FPS is a fun thing to play around with. But then you start dealing with potential crashing and then people freak out when their graphics card turns black and then it restarts. All I'm saying to go in there and do is turn up your fan profile to a noise that's comfortable to you because keeping your graphics card cooler means keeping the boost clocks higher and maxing out the power limit. As long as you have a plenty you know, RPM running on your fan, you can raise the power limit, get more FPS because it will allow the boost clocks to technically go higher and longer because you're allowing more power to the GPU. Now maxing out your power limit is something built into the VBIOS of your graphics card and it's not gonna hurt it. It will not hurt it in any way whatsoever. The manufacturer has determined based on that, co that card, its power delivery system and the cooler that is installed on it, this is a safe limit. So whether it be going from 100 to 102, 105, 110, 115, or 120, 130, depending on the graphics card, you might be running some big giant for the win three card and running it at 100%. You don't realize you have 30% power limit available to you, which means easily another couple hundred megahertz of frequency leading to several FPS increase in your games, depending on, on the resolution. By doing nothing more than moving that slider and raising your fan curve, you might see as much as 10% more FPS, and that's free. So you can't hurt your graphics card by moving those sliders. You, and not even talking about moving the frequency. You can start playing around with that later if you want. Power limit increase and increasing your fan speed and the curve it's gonna give you better performance and, and better cooling for your graphics card, which leads to more frequency, more megahertz, more FPS. Now, another thing that a lot of people may not realize is actually stealing and robbing performance from your system is just how cluttered your operating system is as time goes on. If you go and look at your startup items, you might see software you never even use anymore. Utilizing system resources, especially at system startups. What this is gonna to lead to is increased boot times, increased Windows login times, and once you're into the desktop, you might see a little spinning wheel, the thinking wheel going on for a while while all these background processes are loading. Now, if you're running on a spinning drive or an old hard drive, this is a very important tip that you need to utilize because of the fact that spinning platter drives are extremely slow by today's standard. The fastest spinning drives that I ever had back in the day on fully clean operating systems would only be able to read write at about 100 to 150 megabytes per second at the fastest. The slowest SSDs that you can buy today, which would be SATA SSDs that still use a SATA cable, are running about 550 megabytes per second. And because they're solid state, means that you don't have to go seeking for it on a spinning platter, you can go seeking for it in sectors of chips in NAND flash is way faster than anything spinning. So if you've got a spinning hard drive that's gotta go seeking for all this hardware and unpack it, or not hardware, but software and unpack it in the OS, turning off any startup items that are not necessary are going to extremely speed up your system. And the same goes for SSDs, but it's just really apparent on spinning drives. So if you're running Windows 10, you're gonna, you're gonna hit Control, Shift, Escape, and you're gonna to go to the tab on the top that says Startup. And when you go to startup, you'll see all the items that are starting when Windows starts. And you'll see either enabled or disabled. Disable all the ones that are not important to you. And if those are programs you don't use anymore, go into your add and remove programs and delete them from your system entirely so you can get them at least off the system. It won't do a registry clean, and we're not gonna talk about that right now because it starts to get more complicated when it comes to those items still being in the registry. 
for a beginner to be comfortable going in and not completely borking their system where it will never post again because of the fact that you, or won't go into Windows again because of the fact that you removed important registry items, stopping them from even being looked at in startup is the first step on cleaning up that system. If you're running Windows 11, it's Control, Shift, Escape. You're gonna look at the left with the little icons. You're gonna find the one that looks like a little RPM gauge. Click on that and then disable items that you no longer need. But you'll be surprised how much faster your system starts up and how much more ready it is when you don't have those items sitting there and running. Oh, and a little bonus content. Just uninstall OneDrive. Nobody should be using OneDrive and if you are, shame on you. But if, I digress. You can write your hate comments to nick at jace2cents.com. Disable OneDrive and delete it. And every time your system updates itself, Windows updates itself, re-delete it again. Because it knows when it's not installed and they keep putting it back. And OneDrive sitting there constantly scanning your drives to sync with something that doesn't exist is slowing down your system. Now the last one here is sort of a physical thing. And this is something everyone should be doing with their systems periodically, especially if you live in a dirty, dusty environment like I do in the desert. Clean your system. I'm talking about your intake filters. I'm talking about all the dust that gets accumulated on your fan cages and the fan blades themselves. I'm talking about your radiators if you've got an AIO or an open water loop, and especially your heat sink tower if, it's, if you've got an air-cooled CPU. And I'm not talking about just blowing some air through it like with canned air and calling it a day. I'm saying remove the fans from the cooler itself blow air through the cooler. Now, a lot of people here are gonna feel inclined to take a shop vac with a brush on there. Don't do that. That creates a lot of static electricity when you have a vacuum cleaner going, creating vacuum and then bristles rubbing over stuff. You don't wanna accidentally, one, knock something loose off your motherboard, or two, create static energy that can cause an issue. If you're worried about dust blowing all over the place, take it outside. Don't use a sh an air compressor with a nozzle. You would be surprised how much damage you can cause by using that much compressed air. I've seen, I've seen mechanics that follow me and go, I just use my 150 PSI air compressor to blow my system clean. Yep, I'm gonna throw my brother-in-law under the bus. About 10 years ago, he did that and he was going woo, 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 on a fan blade going, this is fun until one of those blades popped off and literally impaled the motherboard. Yes, it happened and killed that, that motherboard. Don't do that. One, it's bad for the bearings. You spin them way faster than the fans are intended to do. And although it makes cool sounds, you're not doing yourself any favors. So can dare at the very least, using one of the, sh the blower shop vacs like we use that are designed for electronics. And if you're worried about the dust, take your shop vac with the vacuum attachment and have it next to the stuff as you're blowing it so it can pull in as much of the dust as possible uh, so it's not blowing all over your house and then take it outside or whatever. And don't hose it off. I know they're just memes going around. I've seen people like hosing their computers down. That's not real, okay? Don't do that. That's like those old memes of like, in the winter time, make sure to replace your tire air with water or whatever, so for whatever the memes are, okay? Those are jokes. Don't hose down your system. But if your CPU cannot transfer the heat properly through the tower or the cooler or the radiator, or you can't get clean air into your system because it's all clogged up on the front fan filter like Phil's system is right now, then what you're doing is you're increasing the internal temperatures and you're actually insulating the cooler because dust is not only electrically conductive, which is bad for your system, it's also an insulator, meaning heat cannot get out of the cooler, it means your CPU is running hotter, which means the core clocks are coming down, which means a slower system. Now, it might cost you 10 bucks or so to go buy canned air if you don't have a compressor of some sort or you don't have a little shop back blower deal like we do. That's just worth having on hand for all sorts of reasons. So. Although that might cost you a few bucks to get the thing you need to blow out your system, cleaning it itself, that is completely free once you have that item and you need to maintain it. If you live in a dirty environment like I do, like I said, you can notice dust accumulation weekly. And it's just worth keeping that system clean for obvious reasons. Anyway guys, what are your best tips for beginners down there in the comments trying to keep their systems running as fast and as tip top shape as possible? You don't have to go out and blow a ton of money upgrading your system, especially if you find that maybe all five of these items apply to you. You would notice if you were to benchmark your system as it currently sits now, do all five of these items and go and benchmark it again, I guarantee you will see an increase in performance. And then once your system is fully cleaned, you can optimize your airflow by making sure you have plenty of intake and exhaust to get balanced airflow for better cooling. In fact, we have a whole video about that that you can click over here somewhere uh, to go and check out how to balance and optimize your system airflow for better cooling, for better performance. Anyway, guys, what is your number one tip that you would give to a beginner trying to keep their system cool 
and running as fast as possible. Make sure to put it down in the comments below. Maybe I will pin the best one. And uh, as always guys, thanks for watching. And as always, we will see you in the next one.